the next telephonic conference date in the SEC versus Ripple is set. The SEC seeks to bar Ripple from getting access to more documents. And Brad here isn't the only one with a crypto market cap. If we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho, and I'm here to help you live a richer life. And on this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you updated on all the latest news and updates. Now, let's jump right into it. Bitcoin trading down, XRP back to $1.30, and you're seeing a lot of red in the market. That's okay. It's another day to buy. Now, let's take a quick look here. This was something I was really excited about. If you saw the episode of Millennial Money last night, you would have seen Andre Jick wearing a crypto market cap. Yes, sir. So check out that video and you'll hear how he got that. Now, uh, besides my own level of excitement for that, which is, is pretty cool, but um, we've got a lot to talk about today. First, James Feinlin has provided us with two very important pieces of information. First of all is the new date, April 30th, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. So nice and early here on the Pacific, which is fantastic, should make it easier to get in, especially now that the line will accommodate 4,000 callers. So by popular demand, you will be able to get access if you are one of the first 4,000 callers. I would expect a lot of interest in this call, so it will probably fill up quickly. Uh, if you do dial in, make sure that you do not record, do not rebroadcast. If I get a chance to listen in, I'll be jotting down notes to be able to summarize, but do not expect to hear a recording out here because they will be seeking sanctions against the people who record it. Please don't do it. Pretty please don't do that. Now, uh, again, courtesy of Mr. Filing here, we have a SEC filing that was very interesting. Now, you can follow him, and please do, because he does a fantastic job of doing these updates from the legal perspective, these filings that he's able to get access to. Uh, again, no legal or financial advice here, but I read through what the SEC was requesting in their order here to, or wanting the court to order barring these documents, and it's really interesting, and I've got it right here. I highlighted what I thought was most important. I thought we could go through this because the SEC, every time they write something, it just sounds so whiny. And I just, I, I don't understand why they take that position. It, it comes across as um, very sarcastic, very just like whiny. I, I don't have a better word for it. Now, as a father of two children under the age of 10, I understand what whiny sounds like. And this definitely sounds whiny, so let's jump right into it. This is what the SEC is requesting, and we'll just read through it here in the intro. The SEC is in the process of complying with the court's April 6, 2021 order and has begun reviewing tens of thousands of external emails from the identified custodians for production pursuant to the order. Defendants are seeking to ignore the limitations of this court's order and to mire the SEC in indefinite discovery disputes and, if successful, document review. The SEC seeks to prohibit defendants from, one, obtaining internal SEC staff communications the court already excluded from production, two, searching SEC staff personal devices, and three, adding custodians. And they go through each of these in detail individually. And I'm going to highlight the things that I thought were most important here. So first things first, they say the order denied defendants access to internal SEC staff communications. The order required the SEC to search the external emails of 19 custodians for documents related to XRP, Bitcoin, and Ether, but denied defendants' requests for internal SEC communications as not relevant to how the market is considering XRP and how the individual defendant and how the individual defendants, how it affects their reasonable belief, and given the potential to seriously chill government deliberations, and he quotes this many times through here. 
As detailed below, the SEC expresses its interpretations and views in a number of ways, all of which are public. These agency interpretations and views are subject to the order, but internal emails and memos expressing SEC staff interpretations and views are not. So they don't want Ripple, uh, Garlinghouse and Larson and their legal representatives to have access to any of the internal information from the SEC. This is very interesting and very curious because it definitely leads one to believe that there is something in there that they don't want to be seen. That's just hypothesizing, but we'll continue. Defendants make new and broader requests inconsistent with the court's order. Defendants wrote the SEC with a laundry list of documents they view as captured by the order, including the very same internal emails that the court ordered the SEC did not have to review and produce, and not just respect to Bitcoin, Ether, or XRP, but with respect to cryptocurrency generally, and asking for the inclusion of a 20th custodian that was not subject to the order or the party's prior discussions. If not constrained now, defendants have shown that they will continue to ignore the court's rulings and demand more endless, burdensome, and unnecessary discovery. Now, the SEC doesn't want to have to find these things. They don't want to have to put it together. And so they continually say in here, and I'm not going to read every time they do it because, like I said, it comes across as whiny and, and quite frankly, rather uh, irritating if I were the judge having to read through this. But they constantly say how it, it's an unnecessary burden for them to provide documents in the discovery phase of this uh, hearing. So let's just take a quick look back over here. Now, this just came out, so this is breaking today. Uh, but we already got Jeremy Hogan with a quick response to this. And look for him to post a video on this. I'm sure he will cover it at least, uh, if not in an entire video on its own, but in passing in another video on his Legal Briefs channel. But he says the judge's initial oral ruling was a touch vague, but contrary to what the SEC states in its letter, she did state she was granting access to internal memos being sent to higher ranking officials expressing the agency's interpretation on these matters. How soon we forget. That being said, it seems Ripple is being very aggressive in pursuit of these documents. We won't know for sure if it overstepped until we see Ripple's response, but eventually this ends up in front of the judge again, and she will have to lay down a more detailed order. So there you go, straight from Jeremy Hogan, who is a lawyer, no legal advice here again, but uh, that's his opinion that he shared on Twitter. Make sure you're following him as well. Now, let's go back and we'll see a few more of the details here. Uh, there is no reason to broaden the court's order, they argue. So this is the SEC's next argument. That two individuals were charged with scienter-based violations does not change this analysis. First, there is nothing improper or novel about suing individuals. So they're talking here about adding Garlinghouse and Larson to the lawsuit. So they're saying, hey, this is not anything new. We've done this in the digital asset space since 2014. And then this is just kind of dirty, in my opinion. So they quote Mary Jo White, who is representing uh, Ripple. Uh, we know her as the former uh, chair of the SEC. Holding individuals liable is for wrongdoing is a core pillar of any strong enforcement program to have a strong deterrent effect on market participants. It is absolutely critical that responsible individuals be charged and that we pursue the evidence as high as it can take us. Now, I can just see them smugly typing this into this letter as they're quoting the people that they're going up against here. And it's just very... <laughs> It's very petty. Uh, petty is the, the best uh, word I can come up with uh, to be able to describe this. And then if you continue here, if the court rules that internal staff views or intra-agency communication about Bitcoin and Ether are relevant to XRP, it will effectively be deciding the Howey issue against the SEC on the merits by ruling that the SEC's internal views as to all digital assets or potentially all investment contracts are relevant to the analysis, a principle that would mire all federal litigation in endless discovery about internal documents each time it brought a civil enforcement again. Uh, 
<laughs> that's a little bit of a stretch in my personal non-legal, non-financial opinion that they are saying that by say by allowing these uh, documents in discovery that the court's ruling against the SEC uh, and deciding the entire case, um, that's, that's a little far, in my opinion. Next, uh, the SEC's interpretations and views on the law must be and are publicly expressed. The Freedom of Information Act requires the SEC to disclose documents that contain any official interpretation of the federal securities laws, including things described above, such as agency rules, but also a broader category, including policies, interpretations, and final opinions. The SEC publishes on its website actions the SEC is taking or certain regulatory actions it is considering taking as well as formal staff views that have been adopted by the agency and are thus appropriate for public release. So what they're arguing here is our agency level views and interpretations are public and must be public by the Freedom of Information Act. And as such, uh, you don't need any internal documents because the agency's view has been made public. Okay, if, if they say so, that's fine. Next, the renewed request for internal SEC staff communications is contrary to this court's order and demonstrates further discovery gamesmanship by defendants. Defendants' approach is part of a pattern of gamesmanship with respect to discovery, and the following examples show that defendants do not actually seek relevant evidence, but rather seek to harass the SEC, derail the case's focus away from its merits, <laughs> and bog down the SEC with document review. <laughs> it, it's hilarious to me that the SEC is complaining about harassment from the people that they're suing who are seeking discovery and, uh, and why they're being uh, pursued in this. It, it's kind of wild, in my opinion. But now they're going right after Mary Jo White again and, and Andrew Ceresny uh, here, uh, knowing full well that they represent legal. So, or the Ripple legal team. It says, two of Ripple's current lawyers were chair of the SEC and director of its in, uh, division of enforcement, which we know, those two individuals. Defendants did not ask for their emails to be searched, even though the then chair of the SEC made public statements as to her own views on whether a digital asset is a security, which would presumably be encompassed within defendants' expansive but misguided theory of relevance. And, then, and the then director of enforcement led the SEC's initial enforcement efforts with respect to digital asset trading. Now, this is just, it, it's so funny that they are, are getting so just petty. You know, uh, it's wild. I, I find it so hard to believe that the, uh, the SEC writes like this <laughs> to the judge, but uh, that, that's them. Um, second, relatedly, defendants' new request that the SEC search the personal devices of SEC employees fits into a broader pattern of trying to make this case about random and irrelevant communications by SEC staff instead of Ripple's unregistered offering of XRP. There is no basis to believe that SEC employees used personal email accounts or devices to express agency interpretations or views on Bitcoin, Ether, or XRP to the market, in part because, as defendants are aware, internal SEC policies prohibit such practices and employees are issued official iPhones, email accounts, and desktops or laptops. So I, I can understand that point. That's probably the one point that I maybe get that, you know, if it's on their personal device, it doesn't represent the agency. Fine. Fair enough. Third, defendants served a third-party subpoena for documents relating to former Chair Clayton's compensation after his tenure at the SEC. Um, and then they complain here that, hey, that's not right because the court already ruled there's no need to produce the bank records of the defendants in this case who made hundreds of millions of dollars from an illegal offering of securities. So they keep harping on the, the main point of the case, right? That this is illegal and they're going to point that out every opportunity they get. But here's the conclusion of what the SEC is saying in their request. It is clear that defendants desire to ignore the order as well as their attempt to engage in broad discovery of the personal communications and finances of public servants is designed to distract the SEC and the court from the merits of the claims against them. 
whilst they now insist that internal staff views are significant despite the order's denial of their request for those documents. Only two months ago, defendants insisted to a different court in a case that resolved that revolved around the meaning of this very lawsuit that it is the commission and only the commission whose actions have the force and effect of law. The SEC respectfully requests that the court reject defendants' improper discovery demands and issue the attached proposed discovery order. And there's plenty of attachments here. This is an over 140-page document, so do feel free to read and do your own research at your leisure. But I hope this was helpful for you to just get an understanding of what the SEC's side is here and what their approach is to try and ensure that Ripple, uh, Garlinghouse, and Larson's representatives do not have access to internal communications. They do not want internal communications at the SEC to be included in part of this case. As I said before, one could hypothesize that there's something that they don't want to come out. Maybe that is just um, being conspiratorial, uh, but who knows? So we will have to wait and see how the judge responds to this. It will be very interesting to see. And as usual, on your way out, hit that like button if you found value here. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already so that you don't miss out on future updates. Thank you so much for being here. I do appreciate each and every one of you for spending some time with me. Have a fantastic evening, and I'll see you in the next one.